said Charisse was an extraordinary dancer. She was trained in Russian ballet, but she brought this high art to the silver screen and changed the way dance was shown in movies forever. Her legs were half-jokingly known as deadly weapons and were insured for a truly staggering amount of money. She could dance with anyone in any style and partnered with legends like Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. And even in uncredited roles early in her career, she blew everyone off the screen, sometimes with performances so suggestive that the censors ripped her from the screen. Her life was one of the most abundant and joyful in Hollywood, but she nevertheless was affected by one of the worst disasters in American history. This is the life of the woman known as The Legs, Sid Charisse. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries. Sid Charisse, whose real name was Tula Ellis Finklia, was born in Amarillo, Texas on March 8, 1922. According to publicity materials from the time, she began ballet classes to regain strength after contracting polio as a child. This is particularly surprising, given that polio is a disease that can seriously debilitate the leg muscles. And yet it was her legs that would bring her to worldwide fame in adult life. Her father made a smart move by bringing the eight-year-old to ballet, and it might just have saved her from disability. However, like many middle-class girls back then, she likely would have taken these lessons regardless, even for a short period. The fact that Amarillo, a town of fewer than 50,000 people in the 1930s, had more than one ballet school, shows just how hugely popular ballet was. This trend was largely due to Hollywood films and touring performances by European, particularly Russian, artists in the 1910s and 1920s. Hollywood films about dancers made ballet appealing enough to be taught even in Amarillo, Texas. For example, Greta Garbo played a ballerina in 1932's Grand Hotel, where she didn't actually dance, but the film's romantic yet tragic aesthetic drove young girls to ballet schools. Tula was nicknamed Sid, spelled S-I-D at first, probably because her younger brother Thomas struggled to pronounce Sis. Later on, when she was a big star at MGM, she insisted on keeping the name, but producer Arthur Freed adjusted it to the more elegant Sid, spelled C-Y-D. Young Tula showed enough talent and determination to study in Los Angeles in the mid-1930s with Russian expatriates Adolf Balm and Branislava Nijinska. She later joined Colonel de Basel's Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, dancing in the corps de ballet under the stage name Felia Sidorova, which she later changed to Maria Istomina. At just 18 years old, she fell in love with and married Greek dancer and teacher Nico Charisse in Paris, during a tour in 1939. They then moved to Los Angeles where he had a school, and two years after their marriage, they gave birth to a son. When World War II disrupted Le Ballet Rouge, Sid and Nico returned to LA where she pursued her dancing career. Charisse appeared in several short films in the early 1940s, often alongside her husband, including the 1941 film Rumba Serenade, which caught the eye of choreographer Robert Alton but Charisse hadn't planned on being in movies. She didn't see herself as an actress and considered herself a dancer. At that time, ballet was considered one of the highest forms of art in the world, requiring unbelievable levels of training, self-discipline, and peak mental and physical performance. Hollywood movies, on the other hand, were often perceived as low forms of art, especially by Europeans. Charisse was one of the first to see the potential of bringing her exceptional talents and training to the magic of the silver screen. She made her first feature film appearance in 1943, thanks in part to her former ballet ruse colleague, David Lichin. She performed an oriental dance number in the finale of Something to Shout About. Gregory Radoff directed the film for Columbia. She was credited as Lily Norwood a variation of her mother's maiden name, and her ballerina character, who had only one line, and was also named Lily. She was again not credited in her second film, the Michael Curtis film Mission to Moscow, nor in several films that followed. In Mission to Moscow, Charisse plays a Russian character, the prima ballerina Asaluda Galina Ulanova, supposedly the best dancer in the world. Joseph Davies, played by Walter Houston, watches her through binoculars and exclaims, 
this is even better than the Russian ballets in New York, to which her Soviet host replies, these are the real Russian ballets. However, after the war, there were obvious ideological reasons that mission to Moscow was no longer shown, and this film is now criticized for its pro-communist stance. However, her dancing skills and striking beauty caught plenty of attention, especially at MGM, the studio best known for musicals. She caught the eye of the tough MGM executive, Louis B. Mayer, when she danced in the 1943 film, Thousands Cheer. Mayer noticed her resemblance to Ava Gardner and asked Warner Brothers if MGM could have Charisse. Warner agreed and it was their loss. The first time Sid Charisse was credited was as a ballerina in the grand opening number of Vincent Minnelli's review, Ziegfeld Follies, in 1945. Now under contract, she got her first real speaking role in The Harvey Girls with Judy Garland. Once again, she dominated the screen every time she appeared. After The Harvey Girls, MGM kept Charisse busy with a range of B-movies in the late 1940s and early 1950s, often loaning her out to other studios. It wasn't only her legs that were grabbing people's attention. Charisse's dark hair and chocolate eyes gave her an exotic look. In this career period, studios cast her in roles alongside other ethnic actors. She frequently co-starred with Mexican actor Ricardo Montalban, appearing together in six films, including the 1947 movie Fiesta with Esther Williams. After Fiesta, she went on to make one of her most interesting early films, at least in terms of how it represented dance on screen. Charisse's ballet films helped popularize ballet all over again, but this time, unlike the Garbo films, the dancing was for real. These big budget backstage musicals and vibrant Technicolor presented a real dream. The most successful was 1948's Powell and Pressburger masterpiece, The Red Shoes. However, the previous year, Charisse was still making her way in a film that was an expensive flop at the time and is largely forgotten today. The Red Shoes inspired many young European and American girls to take ballet lessons. However, it did not achieve the feat of allowing its heroine to choose ballet over family life without fatal consequences. That was what Charisse achieved in the unfinished dance. Even though Charisse was the only actual dancer, three performers in the unfinished dance played classical dancers, child star Margaret O'Brien, Charisse, and Karen Booth. The film is listed as a musical, but MGM's press book marketed it as, quote, a grand technicolor musical, innovative and original, a glamorous technicolor drama about the ballet world, and a thrilling romantic drama. The relative lack of comedy is partly because The Unfinished Dance is a remake of the 1937 French film La Mort du Cygne, which featured Mia Slavenska, Yvette Chauvire, and Janine Chara, all professional dancers in their first, and for some only, commercial film. Based on Paul Morant's novel of the same name, La Mort du Cygne depicts a preteen dancer idolizing her young ballerina teacher. When a rival mocks her idol, the child named Rose opens a trap door during a performance permanently injuring the rival. Rose must face the severity of her crime and discovers that her victim was destined for greatness, while her idol, whom she tried to protect, is just a modest dancer who easily abandons her career to marry. La Mort du Cygne is not a musical and was not seen as one by critics. Instead, it is a serious study of the life of a young ballet student Released in the United States as Ballerina in 1938, it was limited to major urban markets but was well received for its raw realism and depiction of childhood mysteries. In contrast, the children in the unfinished dance are meant to be cute, endearing, and incapable of any real malice. The fall into the trapdoor is merely an unfortunate accident. The opening credits set to an orchestral arrangement of Debussy's La Mort du Cygne and the text, long before people sang, they danced. Out of their dancing grew a new world, strange and wonderful, the world of the ballet. This is a story of that world, of those who love and of those who hate, and of those who loved too much. Charisse's feet then move as she begins rehearsing a solo to a Tchaikovsky pastiche, watched by Meg, played by Margaret O'Brien. The scene alternates close-ups of Meg's adoring face with images of Charisse's Ariane Boucher, revealing that Ariane is her idol, Ariane has a special bond with her little sparrow, ensuring she is doing well in class and helping her lace her shoes. 
Yet later, Adian claims she barely knows this child, which shows the script's many inconsistencies. When the Metropolitan Opera Company, made up mostly of women and children, gathers to hear the old wealthy director announce that La Darina, played by Karen Booth, will be dancing with them, Meg worries that Darina will replace Ariane as the prima ballerina. She tells her best friend she will turn off the lights during the performance of Swan Lake, making everyone laugh at the new dancer and allowing Ariane to reclaim her spot. Instead, Meg pulls the wrong lever and Darina falls through a trap door, leaving her permanently disabled. Ariane is immediately promoted in the same scene. When Meg asks if she is happy, Ariane responds, I am the happiest woman in the world. I am now a prima ballerina. However, Meg is soon consumed with guilt upon learning that Darina can no longer dance. She visits Darina, dances for her, and discovers that Darina now wants to become a dance teacher, which she finds even better than being a prima ballerina. Meg confesses that she caused the accident and says she didn't mean to hurt her. No one, not even Darina, condemns her actions. But Ariane decides to marry and leave the company. Darina visits Ariane, who is trying on beautiful clothes and chatting away, and says, you are getting married, miss? I didn't know. Ariane exuberantly replies, I'm giving up ballet. My fiancé insists and I'm thrilled. I've had enough of classical dance since I was five. I'll stop gladly. When Darina comments that Ariane's character is important, Ariane responds, It was important to me too, but not anymore. She leaves and Ariane bites her lip as Swan Lake plays again, ending the sequence. In the grand, flashy finale, Holiday for Strings, Meg and Ariane dance together as ballerinas. Ariane's ex-fiancé watches from a box with his new companion, saying, I don't know what that child told her, but she doesn't want to see me anymore. Meanwhile, Darina's eyes fill with tears as she proudly watches the stage, with everyone happy and in their place by the end. Initially, the story of the unfinished dance was meant to be much closer to the French film it was based on, including the crucial aspect of Ariane's character being less artistically accomplished than Darina. The descriptions of classical dance in the script were often overblown and a little pretentious, a common trait in Hollywood films that tried to elevate their prestige with references to the high arts. Apart from Darina's fall scene, Sid Charisse performs nearly all the dances in the unfinished dance, either solo or with MGM's dance core, any of whom, except the children, outshine Karen Booth, who clearly had no training. Thanks to Charisse's talent and skill, the film ultimately emphasizes the importance of professional dance while making the love plot nearly invisible. Ariane Souter, one of the few male characters, is handsome, wealthy, charming, and very kind, yet he is quickly dismissed. Although Ariane's character is shallow and her motivations underdeveloped, happy to be a prima ballerina, happy to get married, happy to return to ballet, the real issue is that Charisse alone possesses the virtuosity needed for the story. Because she is so good, we understand why she might abandon romance for classical dance, a choice rarely depicted so easily in Hollywood films. Nonetheless, as an early dance film that elevates the actual dance itself above all other elements, there are few movies quite like it, and seeing Cherise perform is magical. No doubt many of you will have noticed that both this and its French predecessor were somewhat influential on Darren Aronofsky's Black Swan from 2010. Cherise first met singer Tony Martin at a dinner party in the mid-1940s hosted by their shared agent. Martin, who had just returned from the war, didn't pay much attention to her. A year later, Charisse was divorced from Nico, so her agent set her up on a date with Martin. This time, they clicked. Martin described her as having stepped out of a dream. Before marrying Charisse in 1948, Martin had been married to Alice Faye and was linked to several beautiful Hollywood actresses. Martin also had a rival for Charisse's heart. Howard Hughes, the eccentric playboy, believed he could steal Charisse away from her new boyfriend. Hughes approached Martin, saying if Martin wasn't in love with Charisse, he wanted to meet her. Martin agreed. Charisse was hurt by Martin's consent, thinking it meant that he didn't care enough to keep her. However, Martin's reasoning was the opposite. He saw it as a test of his worth as a boyfriend. If Hughes could win her over, Martin believed he wasn't the right man for her. Hughes was so confident he'd win Charisse that he gave Martin a pair of open-ended first-class plane tickets to anywhere in the world. 
Hughes thought Martin would find another woman and leave. Instead, Martin took Charisse to London, where they got married. This slightly unusual game definitely backfired on Hughes, although Charisse must have wondered how she could get a simple and straightforward declaration from either of these men. The fact that both Charisse and Martin had been married before seemed to help them succeed as a couple. In their joint autobiography, they explained that their previous marriages helped them succeed in their own. They never competed with each other. She danced and he sang, and they supported one another for the rest of Charisse's life. Though Martin and Charisse toured together later in life, they never starred in a movie together. They both appeared in the 1946 film, Till the Clouds Roll By, but Martin sang while Charisse danced with Gower Champion. Charisse also had a brief cameo in 1953's Easy to Love, where Martin bumps into her near the end. The marriage soon resulted in pregnancy, but it was a case of bad timing in some respects. While pregnant with their son, Tony Jr., Charisse was offered a huge opportunity, the lead role in An American in Paris, which she had to turn down. Charisse also had to give up the role of Nadine in Easter Parade after she hurt her knee badly while filming a dance scene in the 1948 movie On the Island with You. Coincidentally, her would-be co-star Gene Kelly also had to withdraw after breaking his ankle playing football. Once again, it seemed her big break was slipping away from her. Her next role as a lead actress came in 1952 when she played a Native American singer in the MGM Western, The Wild North. Oddly, despite being the studio's resident ballerina, Sid doesn't dance in this film at all, although she does sing, or at least appears to sing. Charisse was an exceptional dancer, but singing wasn't exactly her strength. MGM gave her voice lessons to lose her Texas accent. Despite these efforts, her singing voice wasn't suitable for Hollywood musicals so her songs were always dubbed. In fact, Charisse's non-musical, non-dancing roles for MGM were generally more profitable than her musical films. Nonetheless, the studio was still pushing musicals, hoping to spark a revival to match the golden age of the 1930s. The bad luck that kept her out of On the Island With You, and the bad timing that nixed An American in Paris, was now about to change. The producers wanted a dream ballet sequence in the upcoming film Singing in the Rain, and Debbie Reynolds, who could barely dance, wasn't the right fit for the number. Gene Kelly initially wanted to cast his dance assistant, Carol Haney. This is where Charisse's luck played in, as MGM executives thought Haney lacked the necessary sex appeal. Director Stanley Donnan said they needed someone who, quote, could stop a man just by sticking up her leg, and Charisse was perfect for that role, a little too perfect, as it turned out. In the sensual vamp dance sequence, both the production code and the Catholic Church's Legion of Decency took issue with one of Charisse's movements and insisted it be removed from the film. If you watch the dance closely, you'll spot an abrupt cut right when Charisse is entwined with Kelly. This was likely the part they found objectionable. While too much leg-to-body contact was considered indecent, the idea of a big star appearing on screen and failing to glamorize smoking was also controversial, and it proved yet another hurdle for Charisse. Before filming Singing in the Rain, Charisse had never smoked a cigarette. The director had to signal her to exhale for her scene with the cigarette holder to avoid choking on the smoke. After that scene, she never touched a cigarette again. Despite her fame, Charisse also had to overcome her shyness. Jean Kelly recalled that the toughest part of working with her was getting her to, quote, show off her beautiful legs and beautiful style. He encouraged her to flaunt her assets and not be ashamed of them and the media soon took note when her famous legs suddenly had a monetary value attributed to them. In 1952, the studio supposedly insured her legs for $5 million, which is around $48.5 million today. This was probably a smart move by MGM, although likely more in terms of its huge publicity value than any real need to take out such a huge insurance policy. Nonetheless, it became movie folklore, and this enormous amount earned her a spot in the Guinness Book of Records for most valuable legs. Charisse is also important for her roles in lesser-known films. She was the only professional ballet dancer born in the United States to succeed in a Hollywood studio career. During this pivotal time in American cinema and dance history, she became the iconic figure of classical dance for the public. In the 1930s, ballet in American films and popular culture symbolized a tradition of morbidity, as dance critic Arlene Croce put it, 
and a dream of success, according to film expert Angela McRobbie. The first idea links ballet to death and illness, seen in the romantic repertoire of the 19th century and the tragic fates of dancers like Anna Pavlova, who tragically made a final request for her swan costume as she was dying in 1931, and Václav Nijinsky, who ended his days in a mental asylum. This also reflects Hollywood's distrust of purely aesthetic movies and art. McRobbie's phrase presents a more positive view. The movie dancer was a kind of dream role, and one of physical control and professional power, especially for women. Other professional ballet dancers had appeared in commercial films before Charisse. Anna Pavlova starred in The Dumb Girl of Portici in 1916, though she did not perform ballet in it. European dancer Vera Zorina was featured in musicals like The Goldwind Follies in 1938, On Your Toes in 1939, and the following years is I Was an Adventuress, dancing to the choreography of her then-husband, George Balanchine. Viola Essen from Ballet Theatre also played a prima ballerina in her only film, Ben Heck's low-budget thriller, Spectre of the Rose, in 1946. Later, French dancer Leslie Caron portrayed a ballet corps member turned prostitute in Gabby, a remake of the 1940 melodrama Waterloo Bridge. However, only Charisse achieved star status as a classically trained dancer, who played both speaking and dancing roles in musicals and non-musical films of the studio era. Following Singing in the Rain, Charisse had an important role in the successful musical romance Sombrero, starring Ricardo Montalban. Her next picture, however, would prove to be one of her finest, and one of the most influential in movie history. It doesn't matter much that Charisse is a classical dancer in the bandwagon, as the film is mainly celebrated for its creators, Arthur Freed and Vincent Minnelli, and for its storyline where the ballerina learns to relax and adapt her artistic style. On the surface, the bandwagon is the tale of a musical star, played by Fred Astaire, at the end of his career who hopes one last big show on Broadway will revive his career. However, the director of the play decides to turn it into a highbrow adaptation of the Faust story. He brings in a prima ballerina whose presence creates tension and conflict with the lead actor. Nevertheless, Charisse gets her own carefully staged classical number, boxed in awe by the other stars, complete with a pause for applause. The film is considered one of the three great masterpiece MGM musicals of this era, along with Singing in the Rain and An American in Paris. One of the reasons is how it attempts to deal with the incoming clash of high and low culture in American society a trait that would come to be defined as postmodernism, and which would dominate art over the coming decades. In this case, high art is represented by American ballerina Gabrielle Gabby Girard, played by Charisse, and her American choreographer-slash-ballet master boyfriend, played by James Mitchell, as well as by Jack Buchanan's British director, with his overly elaborate classical adaptations. On the other hand, popular culture is represented by professional dancer Tony Hunter, played by Fred Astaire, and his friends Lester and Lily. Charisse had a quick answer when asked about her favorite dance number. It was Dancing in the Dark from the bandwagon with Fred Astaire. She loved the dance's simplicity and Astaire's charm and elegance. We never see a finished number in Cordova's first show, only the labor and setup involved. In contrast, the later numbers, even when Tony Hunter and his friends take over, and Gabby leaves her dancer boyfriend and learns to dance jazz, are very successful, and their show, Rehearsals of Which We Do Not See, becomes a huge hit, allowing Gabby and Tony to live happily ever after. Before we see Charisse as Gerard, she is described as a great artist with flame, charm, grace, and beauty. When we finally see her, it's during her classical number as the star of the Coutre Ballet Company. In the audience, Astaire's character, Hunter, whispers that Charisse is fabulous, sensational, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, later telling her she is fantastic, magnificent. James Mitchell's controlling character, who presumably managed Gabby's career before she met Tony and Jeffrey Cordova, never dances or choreographs in the bandwagon. Instead, he is depicted as an extraordinarily sexist jerk who is quickly discarded. More than the unfinished dance, this film shows Charisse as a great artist who demonstrates more flexibility in her dance than any other actor. Conversely, Astaire learns to lift her more easily, but never practices classical dance. Charisse never tap dances in her films, but she merely does an impromptu time step with Astaire during a rehearsal. 
It seems she doesn't enjoy tap dancing and doesn't need to do it, yet she is capable. If the show within the bandwagon had failed, she could have returned to her dance career, something Tony Hunter couldn't say. And while she was not being lifted on screen in this movie, her career was most certainly being lifted at this point. Even if the bandwagon performed relatively less well than an American in Paris in Singing in the Rain, it was still very popular. And now she had danced on screen with both Kelly and Astaire. When asked to compare the two greats, she said, As one of the handful of girls who worked with both of those dance geniuses, I think I can give an honest comparison. In my opinion, Kelly is the more inventive choreographer of the two. Astaire, with Hermes Pan's help, creates fabulous numbers for himself and his partner, but Kelly can create an entire number for somebody else. I think, however, that Astaire's coordination is better than Kelly's. His sense of rhythm is uncanny. Kelly, on the other hand, is the stronger of the two. When he lifts you, he lifts you. To sum it up, I'd say they were the two greatest dancing personalities who were ever on screen. But it's like comparing apples and oranges. They are both delicious. And the great Astaire was equally complimentary, maybe even a little smitten with her. Charisse was not only talented, but also known for her stunning looks. She was tall, long-legged, glamorous, and sensual. Astaire described her in his 1959 memoir as beautiful dynamite, adding, that Sid, when you've danced with her, you stay danced with. Standing at five foot six inches, Sid Charisse might not have seemed very tall, but she looked almost six feet tall with high heels and stockings. This became an issue when she danced with Jean Kelly and Fred Astaire, who were only slightly taller than her. To balance their heights, she often wore flats while dancing with them. The different dance styles of the two men were evidenced on Charisse's body. Tony Martin claimed he could always tell which partner Charisse had been dancing with by the state of her body when she came home. If she was bruised and battered, she had been dancing with Jean Kelly. If she looked relatively unscathed, it was Fred Astaire. Sid Charisse's ballet films made her a symbol of the Americanization of classical dance in the 1940s and 1950s. The migration of various artistic centers from Europe to the United States after World War II is complex, but the rise of American ballet in the post-war era is often linked to George Balanchine's schools and companies in New York, starting in 1933. Balanchine continued the fusion of avant-garde styles with traditional dance techniques, applying them to athletic and idealized American bodies of the time. Although it is not confirmed that Shuri studied with Balanchine, her famously agile body and long legs became the archetype of the American dancer by the late 1950s. Her versatility and ability to perform both classical numbers and more American jazz or folk style ballets were key in theatrical and film musicals. The 1954 film Brigadoon, starring Kelly and Charisse, wasn't a big box office hit. Despite that, it was Charisse's favorite film with Kelly. She replaced the original star after Katherine Grayson's contract ended, and Moira Shearer declined the role. During the 1930s to 1960s, film censorship was strict. Yet the dance sequence between Kelly and Charisse and Brigadoon is one of the most sensual and memorable scenes in movie history. Charisse explained, we got away with murder in those days because it was dance. Charisse didn't view acting as hard work. In an interview with the Saturday Evening Post, she said acting was like a vacation compared to dancing. Despite this, she never considered giving up dancing. If forced to choose, she said dance would always win. However, the truth is that unlike acting, dance has a short time limit and the body will start to impose its limits at an early age. By the late 1950s, Charisse was no longer able to perform to the standards she had set herself as a younger woman. At just 37, it was time for her to retire from dancing on the big screen. Furthermore, by the late 1950s, movie musicals were declining as television started to take over, making musicals too expensive to produce. But before the end of the career of the woman known as The Legs, audiences would get a couple more chances to see her in action. And one of the best examples came in 1956 when she starred in Meet Me in Las Vegas. Charisse's duality, being both an entertainer and a professional dancer, is evident in Meet Me in Las Vegas, where she plays a ballerina named Maria Corvier. Maria is introduced as the first ballerina to perform in a Las Vegas casino. A billboard for her show at the Sands labels her as the prima ballerina of the Ballet de France. Her charming but paternalistic agent Pierre who secured her casino contract, stays in New York enjoying time with other dancers from Swan Lake. 
Maria is portrayed as frigid and repressed, spending all her time rehearsing or resting. When excited, she takes cold showers to cool down. Pierre is the only man in her life, but treats her like a kind of dancing cash cow. Then Chuck, played by Dan Daly, a ranch owner and unlucky gambler, discovers that Maria brings him luck at the tables. He persuades her to go out with him that night and they win money at every casino. During a trip to meet Chuck's mother, a late role for Agnes Moorhead, a dry oil well gushes and hens start laying eggs abundantly, among other miraculous events. It seems the moody ballerina is a walking good luck charm. Naturally, since this is a musical, Chuck and Maria fall in love. Once they become a couple, their luck vanishes. They break up, reunite, and finally plan to spend six months at the ranch and the rest of the year touring with the company. The film ends with Chuck kissing Maria in a tutu and ballet slippers. As the kiss lingers, Maria's legs extend as she rises on point, and the symbolism isn't too hard to uncover here. This is another example of Hollywood directors finding clever ways to circumvent censorship of anything remotely sexual. Meet Me in Las Vegas was promoted as an MGM entertainment treasure, known for its wide galaxy of stars, many making brief appearances. Lena Horne, Frankie Lane, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., albeit voice only, Debbie Reynolds, Eddie Fisher, Vic Damone, and more showed up at various points. Partly shot on location, it was described by The New Yorker as a grand and bland homage to the wonders of Nevada's gambling capital. Charisse dances in two long, beautifully shot ballets choreographed by Eugene Loring, an abstract rehearsal number in Balanchine style, performed in a leotard, and a modernized version of Sleeping Beauty, where she is knocked out by a volleyball instead of pricking her finger on a cursed spindle, then awakened by a young man in white pants and a polo shirt. However, the film never denies the value of ballet or its ability to entertain. Charisse's Maria succeeds in Las Vegas as a ballerina and already knows how to dance in a jazzier style. She doesn't need to change to be more accessible or appealing. Maria is normal in a sense supported by the film. She wants to marry for love, but also remain a professional dancer. Pierre is condescending, telling her, a ballerina shouldn't think, and calling her his big baby. He also tells Chuck that ballerinas are nervous creatures, and that he's never met one who didn't live for applause. Unlike the American in Paris Ballet or the Broadway Melody from Singing in the Rain, Ballet in Meet Me in Las Vegas is not a medium for psychological expression. However, it is undeniably feminine. The male classical dancers are anonymous and don't embody characters. Many of them exist, but only the ballerina has an identity in the story. This narrative, though not exactly progressive, is interesting because the male dancers are just anonymous spectacles, while the ballerina has the power to transform. The man watching her isn't just experiencing the pleasure of looking at her, he is transformed by what he sees. Charisse was a pioneer in this field of making ballet important and meaningful in movies, practicing her art seriously even in silly or trivial plots. Meet Me in Las Vegas may not be a masterpiece, and Hollywood would never have been interested in her without her beauty and long legs. After all, it is fetishism that often sold those tickets in those days and it sold plenty of those, becoming a major box office smash. However, probably more than any other classical dancer in film, Charisse represented an art form as closely as possible to its real form in classical ballet. In Meet Me in Las Vegas, after Chuck sees Maria dance for the first time, she says, I thought you didn't care for ballet, to which she replies, that's what I thought too, but I was wrong. Throughout the 1940s and 1950s, Sid Charisse, the Hollywood ballerina, likely evoke this feeling in many moviegoers. Charisse's last film was Silk Stockings in 1957 with Fred Astaire. The film didn't do well at the box office, but the performances were still excellent. Audiences were surprisingly unenthusiastic, even with the knowledge that Charisse and Astaire would retire from dance films after this movie. A scene in Silk Stockings almost got cut by censors because of a brief shot of Charisse's exposed legs. The producers had to add a high back chair for her to run behind, but viewers at least still got a glimpse of her legs through a see-through petticoat later on. Interestingly, it was a remake of a Greta Garbo film, 1939's Ninochka, and it seems a fitting way for Charisse to bow out of dance, remaking a film by the woman who had first ignited the fascination with on-screen ballet among Americans. While dancing on screen was over for her, she found herself with plenty of opportunities to act. 
First, she moved to Universal to co-star with Rock Hudson in the 1958 film Twilight for the Gods. Then MGM considered Charisse for the role of Eve Kendall in the 1959 movie North by Northwest, but Alfred Hitchcock preferred Eva Marie Saint. In 1959, Charisse joined other former MGM musical stars by getting her own variety special on NBC as part of the Ford Star Time series. Her episode featured two dances with her former screen partner, James Mitchell, and a song and dance number with her husband. Even though her film career was winding down by the 1960s, Charisse didn't plan to stop dancing. In 1963, she and Martin created a nightclub act and took it to Vegas and other U.S. cities. She danced and he sang, a perfect match. She was familiar to TV audiences too, appearing on Martin's show in a striptease act, as well as showing up on The Ed Sullivan Show and many other roles in major shows like Hawaii Five-0, The Love Boat, and Fantasy Island through the 1970s and 1980s. She was enjoying life immensely. She continued to dance, act, and perform, and had adapted herself to every medium that she tried. And she was deeply in love with her life partner. So it was all the more devastating when in 1979, she got a call that broke her heart. Her daughter-in-law, Sheila Charisse, was a passenger on American Airlines Flight 191. The McDonnell Douglas DC-10 was taking off from runway 32R at O'Hare International, when its left engine detached from the wing, leading to a loss of control. The aircraft crashed approximately 4,600 feet from the end of the runway. All 271 people on board were killed, along with two individuals on the ground. With a total of 273 fatalities, it remains the deadliest aviation accident in United States history. And the crash was so devastating that around 30 of the victims were unidentifiable. Sheila was just 36 at the time of her tragic passing. Charisse's impact on 1980s dancers was huge. At age 68, she appeared in Janet Jackson's music video, All Right. Jackson, who loved the musicals featuring Charisse, Astaire, and Kelly, gave her a cameo. Charisse remains one of the few prima ballerinas to appear in a music video. Furthermore, the now legendary dance for Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal was partly inspired by her routines in the bandwagon. The dancers in Michael Jackson's video perform similar moves and wear period clothing reminiscent of Fred Astaire's style. Jackson himself dons a white suit with a blue collared shirt and a white fedora with a black stripe, mirroring Astaire's iconic outfit from the Girl Hunt Ballet. Jackson even borrows a line from the same segment, She Came At Me In Sections, for the title song of his album Dangerous. However, in Smooth Criminal, Jackson and his dancers add their own unique elements including the famous anti-gravity lean that looks physically impossible. Smooth Criminal won Best Music Video at the 1989 Brit Awards. The Critics' Choice also honored it with Best Video, and the People's Choice Awards named it Favorite Music Video that same year. One thing that was missing from her incredible resume was Broadway. Surprisingly, she was able to add this to her list of achievements as late as 1991, when she was 69 years old. Broadway director Tommy Toon was a fan of Charisse's movie musicals. When she auditioned for his musical Grand Hotel, he was so impressed that he said, I should be auditioning for you. She got the part right away. She admitted that putting on the ballet shoes again was tough, but the thrill of Broadway made it worth it. Charisse described her character in Grand Hotel as out of her mind because she had no career left in her older years. This was far from Charisse's reality. Even after movie musicals faded, she had continued acting and performing with her husband for almost 40 years, doing it, as she said, for the joy of it. Proving that age is just a number, Charisse, at 76, collaborated with a chemist friend in 1996 to create a product to alleviate her mother's severe arthritis pain. The result was Arctic Spray, which, although no longer available, was sold in pharmacies across the United States. In 1994, she appeared in That's Entertainment 3 as one of the on-screen narrators, celebrating MGM musicals. The Nijinsky Award, called the Oscars of the Dance World by the Los Angeles Times, honors the best dancers and choreographers globally. On December 15, 2000, Princess Caroline of Monaco presented this prestigious award to Charisse for her lifetime achievements in dance. Charisse passed away from a heart attack in June 2008. 
Her funeral and burial arrangements were unique due to her and her husband's different faiths. As a practicing Methodist married to a Jewish man, she had a Methodist service but was buried in a Jewish cemetery in California. After her death, Martin told People magazine that he wished he could live his life over to spend more time with her. They were married for 60 years. The Boston Globe's obituary noted that Charisse expressed her persona through movement rather than dialogue. Charisse likely agreed, telling the New York Times in 1992, that dancing is about playing a role. It's not just steps. Despite her fame, Charisse remained humble. I never thought of myself as a star, not even after I made my biggest films she would say in her later years. Perhaps that's because I am basically an introvert. I knew that I loved working, performing. What the public made of it was their business. I hope that they liked me and admired my work, of course, but that pedestal they stuck me up on was insignificant in my view. Upon her passing, Sid Charisse was widely remembered and honored for her contributions to film and dance. The Washington Post headline read, She put the move in movies stating that Sid Cherise danced rings around even the best. The Boston Globe called her a cool classic, describing her as the choreographic equivalent of a classic Sinatra LP. Cherise's impact on MGM and the golden age of Hollywood musicals was unparalleled. Sarah Kaufman of the Washington Post wrote, Unlike the other great movie dancers, Cherise had a whole different way of carrying herself. Pulled up in light, those legs stroking forward like a cat's, because she had been a ballerina before she ever danced a step with Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly. That's all from this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. Why not check out our Patreon and members area, where we go further into the strange and sometimes surreal world of Hollywood and our weekly essays and other fascinating pieces of content. Otherwise, take a look at our amazing t-shirts featuring silent stars Anna Mae Wong and Ramon Navarro, our own exclusive designs, available on the Hollywood Mystery Store. Links are down below in the bio. Don't, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you want to support the channel. Until next week, sweet dreams.